Well, friends, welcome, welcome. It's Tuesday night, and with you, with all your gal pals to study God's Word, it's good, isn't it, to be here? Chiller, chiller sunshine. It's good to be in the presence of good people. So uh, welcome to anyone who's new or if this is your first time. Uh, how women's Bible study works is we do a little time of worship, then we'll do some teaching time, and then if you are new, if this is your first night and you don't have a table, what you do is after the talk, you come down here and Christian matchmaking happens, right? <laughs> I find you a table, and boom, the rest is history. Love is in the air. So um, if you need a table, come down after the talk, and we'll make sure that you have a community of people uh, to do life with in this season. Uh, I have a few quick announcements for us before we get started. Last week, I promised you a bake sale. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have anyone sign up. None of the students were available. This, uh, Britt, it's not your fault. Britt is one of our CA student leaders, and she's amazing. Uh, we just, nobody could come tonight. So we're just going to keep hoping that the kiddos bake for us and that we can support them to go to Hume. So one of these nights, they'll be here, and sweets abound, right? Sweets abound. Um, if you have not heard yet, we have little welcome things that say arise on them out in the front. Uh, we are going back up the mountain for women's retreat. So I want to tell you that as of this morning, we have 331 women registered, which if you do some fast math, that's about approximately 70 spaces left. And so we're filling up fast. So if you're sitting here thinking, I'm so excited to go on retreat and you haven't signed up yet, I wanna encourage you sign up because all it takes is one week in service announcement and those spots will be filled. So we'd love for you to come up on the mountain with us. Uh, it's our chance to get away from the busyness of life. It's our chance to connect with God and other women. And so if you've never been, anyone here never been on a retreat? Okay, so I had, when I was 12, I'd never been on retreat, and my mom, who's actually here, this is my sweet mom, she, she told my sister and I, she said, you, we just had joined a new church, and she said, you need to go on retreat. I will pay you what it costs to go on retreat if you go and you don't like it. So I was like, money in the bank. So anyway, so I went on retreat, and it changed my life. I encountered Jesus in a whole new level in that place. Uh, I got baptized on that retreat. It changed who I was as a person. So I don't know if that's exactly the story that you will have, but I want you to know that God does miraculous things when we put ourselves in positions of humility and surrender and say, okay, I'm scared to go on the mountain. I don't know anybody, but I'm going to trust you. Lord. So I want to invite you, if you've never come on retreat, uh, pray about coming up with us. I believe God has something for you up there. I unfortunately don't have the cash flow to pay you the money, but maybe somebody else does. So ask a friend. So, um, but true story. Um, I announced last week we have our Africa trip coming up. We're going to Africa to visit Julie Boyd in the living room this upcoming fall. Uh, Tanya will be leading that trip. We have only seven spaces. That's how many spaces the living room offers us. So uh, I just want to encourage you, application closes January 18th, which is this week. So if you are praying about going, hoping to go, make sure you get your application in. Uh, we hope that this will not be our only trip because there's so many limited spaces. We hope to be able to go in the years to come, just knowing how many women want to go. So if this isn't your season, uh, don't lose hope. We hope that we'll be going in again in the future. So turn that in if you need to. Um, I, this is not on the slide, but I just want to make note of it. Uh, we have a class called Perspectives at our church that is starting up next week. It's Monday nights. It's a 16-week course taught by missionaries who come off the field to teach, and it's about having a global-minded perspective in the kingdom of God. Um, if for some of my friends who have done it, it's been life-changing. It's an honor to have it on our campus. Usually there's one or two places in a city that will have it and people will travel from all over to get a course that's live and it happens to be at our facility. Uh, the cost is $240, uh, but well worth it. A dinner is provided every single night um, and it's a really good chance for you to just to build community with others and get a heart for really what God's doing in the world and really what his call for you is on mission with God. So if that's something you're interested in, missions, uh, ministry, global kingdom perspective, uh, I encourage you to check that out and sign up. They start next Monday. Ah, and then last but not least, every week we take an offering. It helps pay for uh, child care, our books, our tech, and we have a new updated QR code, which we feel very high tech about. So uh, that's for anybody watching online. The QR code will pop up. It's on our website. It's also on the back of your leader's name tag. So every week we take that no obligation to give. Thank you uh, for those who do give. So you ready to dive in? Jonah one. I'm ready to. Let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for just the power of your word, Lord. You, you meet us in your word. Your word is alive and active. And so, Lord, I just pray a blessing over anyone who came here tonight uh, off a hard day, off a hard week, off a hard season. Father, I invite you to speak a fresh word to them. God, we know that your word is alive and that it ministers to us. And so would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear uh, whatever it is that you want us to take out of tonight, God? Uh, we 
surrender to you and we say, Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Amen, friends. Uh, So we are diving in. We did not read the first chapter of Jonah together last week. Last week was an introduction, and we talked about the fact that Jonah is a satire. That's the genre of literature is in. So if you're joining us for the first time, when you read Jonah, it's an exaggerated story that's meant to draw social critique out of what we're reading. So it's meant to cause you and I, the readers, to look at that text, make a judgment about it or make an assumption, and then look in the mirror and reflect, oh, is, do I do that sometimes? Could that be me? Do I sometimes not listen to Jesus? Not me, right? So it's a chance for us to be honest and allow the Lord to speak into areas of disobedience in our own hearts. So that's the story of Jonah. Uh, and so we are gonna dive in. We're gonna read the first six verses together. And I have very six little mini lessons, uh, just thoughts and observations to pull out of the text. So Uh, Let's start. It will be up on your screens. If you don't have a little book, I think there was one period where a few people walked in that books weren't out on the table, but there are books out on the table. If you didn't grab one, feel free to grab one now when I'm talking and won't be offended. Or afterwards, there's free little books and you can follow along there. So Jonah 1, 1 through 6. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each one cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Good word, huh? All right, so we're just going to break it up verse by verse, and I'm going to share a little reflection that I felt like the Lord was leading me to in this. So verse number one, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. So the first thing that we see in this book is that God names who Jonah is. Jonah has a name. He is the only character named in this book. Now, I have a little spiel. I get really passionate about names. So if you've done Bible study with me before, I say this every session, but I say it because now some people are new to Bible study and they don't know this. Uh, Names have deep biblical significance. The power of a name was literally a one-word autobiography in the Old Testament. When you were named something, that summed up your entire essence. And so the power that is in a name defines who someone is. So when it says in that first text, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, Jonah means son of faithfulness or dove which again, we're in a satire, there's humor, there's irony. So here is a son of faithfulness, a dove, which often represents the Holy Spirit and peace in the Bible. That's what Jonah's name symbolizes. And because this is a satire or a a humorous wit to draw out points, instantly this should strike something in us. Because we know from studying last week, the backstory to Jonah is that he's the prophet who prophesied over the bad king that everything would go well. So we read this, Jonah, son of faithfulness, dove, peaceful, filled with the Holy Spirit. And you and I should instantly think, what? That's what his name means? That's not who he is. That's not his character. We don't, we know what that guy did back there and it was not faithful. Uh, so that's what Jonah's name means. And so when we, when we read this text, the first thing I want us to examine is what is our own essence? What is our own identity? What is your identity? Because so much of obedience comes down to knowing who we are and knowing whose we are. You see, when we don't understand who we are, when we don't receive what Christ has offered us, a new identity, a fresh start, when we believe in Jesus, the Bible tells us that we are adopted into the family of God. So we are children of God. We are princesses in essence because Jesus is the king. So when we come to believe in Jesus, we get a new identity. And you and I cannot be obedient. We cannot be faithful if we don't know who we are. Why? Because we will seek to define ourselves by anything that seems convenient or comfortable. 
right? When we don't have our true, our true feet rooted in our real identity, not a false identity, but a real identity, we make decisions out of scarcity mindsets, out of fear, out of comfort, out of something that might make me look good, which might give me status, which maybe will allow more people to like me or to love me. When we don't know that we are loved unconditionally, all of our decisions will in an unintentionally start coming out of all of our insecurities. And so no longer is it us trying to be obedient. It's just us trying to stay alive. It's trying to feel okay about ourselves. It's trying to feel like we matter. It's trying to feel like we have purpose. And suddenly we take the control of defining ourselves instead of letting ourself be defined by the one who made us, the creator. So I could, we could go into like a 12-week series about identity. There's so much more to unpack here. But what I want to encourage you with today is that you and I were created by a loving God. We were created in the image of God. We are image bearers. It's like God took his heavenly, holy fingerprint and imprinted it into each one of us. And so you and I bear resemblance to the king. We matter our lives have value. We have dignity, not even because anything we did, which is, should be good news for us because some of us, some seasons we do bad things, some seasons we do good things. Our worth is not dependent on what others think or what we do. It's all dependent on the blood of Jesus, what Jesus already did for us because we couldn't do for ourselves. And so when we start this book, we have to start with looking at who we are. Do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? Do you know that Jesus has already paid the price for you so that you don't have to be perfect? You don't have to prove that you have worth or value. You have inherent worth and value because of who your father says you are. That's our first lesson today. Do you know who you are and whose you are? So Jonah, we start with his name, his essence, son of faithfulness. That's who God created Jonah to be. That's who God saw him as. That was meant to be the essence of his character, how he lived, how he spent his days, how he, it was supposed to inform how he thought and how he acted towards others. But we see in the satire that it doesn't really go like that. But I won't, no spoiler alerts, okay? Let's keep going. Verse two says, so go, this is what God says to him, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. That's my second point. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading my notes. I just wrote them earlier. Okay, so second point, clarity of calling, right? God doesn't make anything about this message unclear. He tells them exactly. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh, which we reviewed last week. This was the kingdom of Assyria, and Assyria was a brutal, brutal place. The actual city was gorgeous. It was laid in marble. There was gardens. They had huge fortresses around it. So anyone who lived there, quote unquote, lived in luxury, but how they treated their enemies was some of the most barbaric societies in all of human history. They de-skinned the people that they captured and made furniture out of it. They built towers on skeletons and skulls to show that their dominion extended over all the nations. They were a very barbaric people. And so when God says, go to Nineveh and preach against it because it's wickedness, that's the wickedness it's talking about, has come against me. Uh, Jonah knows exactly where he's going. It's not like, go to Medford, and you're like, well, here's Medford, right? He knows that he's going to the, one of the most evil capitals of civilization. So God makes it very, very clear what Jonah is to do. However, we'll see that this doesn't deter Jonah from being obedient. See, as my job as a pastor, I meet with so many people that say, oh, Coley, like, I have no idea what God's calling me to do. Like, I'm not a pastor. I don't hear his voice. I can't, how do I be obedient? I mean, in the Bible, it's so, so clear that, you know, God told him exactly what to do. God's never told me exactly what to do. And the first thing I'll say to that is, when Jesus came, Jesus summed up all the commands into two commandments. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So when you and I don't know what to do, we know what to do. We need to love Jesus. 
That's where it all starts. If you're in a season where you're making a big decision about your life, maybe you're deciding to move across the country, maybe you're deciding to marry somebody, maybe you're deciding uh, where should I serve, who should I be friends with, how do I fix this relationship? No matter where we are, we always know what to do. We always seek to love Jesus with all of our mind, with all of our heart and all of our soul. And then second, we seek to love those around us. So you might be thinking, I don't know if I should take this job or this job. And that is part of being in relationship with Jesus. You see, we have the privilege to hear from God. He's given us the Holy Spirit to be able to hear him. And one of the main ways we hear him is through his word. His word is alive and active. So when you and I read the Bible with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit promises to guide us into all truth. That the, the Holy Spirit helps us understand scripture. All of scripture is God breathed and it's God's love letter to us. And so when we don't know to do, we run to Jesus, we seek to love him, we seek to love others around us, and we turn to his word. We say, God, speak to me. I'm humbling myself before you. I need wisdom, I need discernment, I need understanding. You see, so much of life is relational, right? God made us relational. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, which is a mystery, it's a relationship between the three in one. And you and I were created in our inmost beings to be in relationship with God. That's where clarity of calling comes from. So I can't tell you what job you should take. I can't tell you if you should move or not. I, shouldn't, I can't tell you how to reconcile a relationship, but God... God wants to be part of every decision you make. And when you don't know what to do, we start with the basic commandments. We love God, we love others, and then we study his word and say, God, speak to me. Show me what I need to know. Convict me where I'm convicted. Give me wisdom. James talks about, the book of James talks about how wisdom is given to all without measure. You and I have the authority as children of God to go to God and say, God, I need wisdom. And the Bible promises that he gives without measure wisdom to those who ask. Do you know what you're called to? Do you know? Do you know in this season? Do you know today? It doesn't have to be long-term assignment. This was a today assignment where God said, go to Nineveh and preach against it. Do you know what the Lord's asking you to do? If you don't, start by seeking to love the Lord seeking to love those around you and reading God's word and asking for wisdom. That's the best place to start. So God calls them to this awful city, preach against it, and we'll see what the son of faithfulness does. Verse three, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So the third thing I see today is running away from God. So often, you and I have the tendency to run away from God. When he calls us to do something that we don't want to do, when he calls us to do something that's scary, when we don't want to hear what his call is, we just want to do our own thing, it's easy to turn and run the other way. So Jonah was called to Nineveh. And where he ended up, Tarshish, was on the other side of the world. So he heard, the son of faithfulness heard this very clear call from God. It wasn't like, should I go to Nineveh? Should I not? I don't know what the Lord's asking. It was a very clear call. And what he did is he got the call and he didn't like it. He didn't want to go to this evil city. Some authors will say it's because he was scared. Uh, I think that's probably in part. But the bigger issue was Jonah did not want the mercy of the Lord to extend to these awful people. He didn't want them to be forgiven. He didn't want them to have a second chance because Jonah knew how evil they were. And so instead of blessing this people with his obedience, he decided, I'm getting out of here. I'm going the opposite direction. So he goes down. It says he buys a ticket. Now, prophets in the Bible usually didn't have a lot of money. They were serving the Lord, and they were making a lot of people mad. But what I'm assuming is that because Jonah prophesied favorably over the bad king, there was some compensation for him in that. He played to the, to the I don't know, goodness of the king, hoping to get a little bit back. But either way, he paid the fare. He paid the price. Here's the thing about sin that we all know, but I'm going to state it in case you've forgotten. There is always a price to pay for sin. Always. There's always a price to pay. You and I can think that we're getting by, that we're getting off the hook easy, that this way looks so fun, it's so exciting, but how great if I go, I go over here and God, I can do ministry over here. There is always a cost 
when we don't obey the Lord. And that cost usually ends, comes up to bite us and to bite all those around us. And here's the sneaky thing about Satan. Satan's main job is to take you and I out so that we are not in connection with the Lord and not serving the Lord. And so in every single one of our lives, you better believe that there is a ship right there at any second you decide not to follow Jesus, a convenient ship that will so conveniently take you in the opposite direction of what Jesus wants you to do. You know what I'm saying? We think we're, you know, we're discerning. We're like, this is so hard. I don't really want to do this. But, oh, look, there's a ship. I'm, I can go this way. Satan wants to make it as easy for us as possible. Oh, don't, he wouldn't want to forgive those evil people. You don't, that's scary. They de-skin people. You don't need to go there. Look where you could, Tarshish. We got beautiful weather in this season, right? There will always be an option out of faithfulness, always. And I can guarantee you, because I've been around the block and I know how the enemy works and he's used it against me, usually what's not what God wants to do seems a lot more appealing, a lot more comfortable, a lot more fit for our vacation mindset, right? Satan knows exactly what it is that trips us up. And so we see Jonah. Jonah just buys it. He goes the other way. And the problem is when you and I, when we start to turn off, I'll call it our consciousness, when we start to intentionally go away from the Lord, what happens is that voice, that Holy Spirit, that truth, that compass that's inside of us, the more we push it down, the quieter and the quieter, and the quieter it gets. So the more disobedient we are, the further away from God's voice and plan that we move, the more we move to our own plans, the harder and harder and harder it is to hear the actual God of, voice of God and what his actual call is. And there's been seasons in my life and I know there's seasons of others' lives where it's like, I cannot hear the Lord I don't know what he wants me to do. And often that can be a result of just our own hardening that we haven't listened to him so often that he becomes more faded and more faded and more faded. Friends, don't let that happen in your life. Don't miss the voice of the father that wants to bring you good. I know it sounds hard. The things that God will call you and I to do seem impossible sometimes, like going to Nineveh to preach against people that de-skin people who do that. That's no easy call. But when you and I move further and further away from that, we lose the Father's voice. We lose the compass, knowing which way to go, and we get lost, and our lives can spin drastically out of control. And that's exactly what happens to Jonah. He hardens his heart, and he runs the other direction, and he hops on a ship away from God and his plan. Do you know what you are running from in this season? Do you know? Do you know what you're called to? And do you know what you're running to? We're always all running towards something. The question I lay before you today is, is it what God has asked of you? Or is it your own plans, your own hopes, your own vision? So that's something we can all put before the Lord today and say, Lord, correct my path if it's not in alignment with what you have for me. So Jonah runs away. He flees from the Lord. Then in verse four, it says, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. So here we see God's power. God is sovereign. We do not serve a weak God. We do not serve a God who can't do anything, whose hands are tied of like, oh shoot, don't. She's running away. God in his power and God in his mercy sends a storm. And this is a mercy to Jonah because he knows if he gets to Tarshish, he might not never come back. He might stop serving him altogether. He might lose that loving connection with the father. And so God sends a storm to make Jonah aware of what he's doing, to coax him back into obedience, to gently bring him back into the fold of why he's called to go to Nineveh. So I wonder right now, is anyone experiencing any storms in this season? Storms are often painful. They're sometimes what we call sanctifying, where God is making us more into his image. But what storms do is they're meant to correct us when we've gone the wrong way. And some of you have done nothing wrong. It's not about correcting you. It's about God using storms to refine your character, to build that deeper intimacy with him, for you to be able to stand on the rock and say, it is only 
through Christ that I live. It's nothing that I do on my own. There's nothing that I can create or manufacture. I'm here from because of the grace of Jesus and for only that. Are there storms in your life? Will you allow God to use the winds and the waves to make you into his image? to direct your path where you need to go. You see, God sends a storm so that it saves Jonah for com- from complete and utter disobedience. He beckons, he beckons him back. He stirs up the pot to say, take notice that this is not right. Something's wrong, something's off. We serve a God of all power, a, gr- a God of grace who ultimately, God's heart is always to call you back home to himself. What are the storms in your life and how will you respond to the storm? Will you continue to fight against it, to run, or will you allow the storm to inform you, to teach you, and for God to be God in the midst of the storm? To claim that God, you are bigger than this storm and I trust you're gonna do something good, though I cannot see it now. I trust that you can use the storm for my good. Will you trust God in the storm to bring you on the right path, to put you back on solid ground? That's what we see the Lord doing in the wave and the wind. So God sends the storm, and in verse five, all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the the load. So verse five is, even the pagans cry out. They cry out to their gods, which in the satire, this is, a shock to us of like, here's Jonah, son of faithfulness. And what's he doing? He's down below. He's hanging out. He's not even calling out to God. He's not even praying. And here are these pagans calling out to their gods. And so I wonder today, when when storms hit, where's the first place that you turn to? Where do you run for help? Who do you cry out to? Do you turn to your friends first? Do you turn into fix-it mode where you're like, I'm going to get this done. I'll figure it out. I've done it before, I'll do it again. Where do you turn when the storm hits? The pagan sailors turned to their gods first. They knew to cry out. They didn't know who to cry out to, but they cried out to a power that was bigger than them that they believed. You and I, as children of God, we get the privilege that we get to call out to the God who created the universe, the God who created the heavens and the seas. Where is that knee-jerk response when something goes wrong? Is it yourself, is it others, or is it God? God invites you. He says, I'm big enough, I'm powerful enough, I can handle whatever you throw at me. Bring it on. Bring it on because I love you. I want your complaints, I want your disappointment, I want your frustration, I want your fears, I want your anxiety, I want it all because I'm big enough to hold it. And so often you and I would get deceived into thinking that something else will fix the situation. Well, if I just get all my girlfriend's opinions, then I'll consult God with what they've said first. Or we write in our journal and make a little plan and we're like, okay, God, this is how it's gonna go. (laughs) Point A to Z, do you have time? We go through all of our little steps that we think need to happen. But really God's inviting us to call out to him, to say, I cannot control this. Lord, there's a storm in my life that's bigger than me. Do what you will, but save me. Save me out of this. I cannot save myself. You see, Jesus came to die for us because we are broken and the world has fallen in their sin. And we cannot repair our relationship with God through effort. No matter how good we are, no matter how many amazing things we do, nothing we do can fix our relationship with God except Jesus Christ. Jesus came and lived a perfect life He lived flawless. He fulfilled every aspect of the law and then he chose to die on the cross to save us for our sins. His death, and three days later he rose again, his resurrection set all those who believe in him free so that you and I don't have to pay the penalty. We don't have to earn our salvation. We can't earn our salvation. The only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ, the king. And he says, I am available to anybody who would believe in me. So if you don't know Jesus today, I want to invite you. Jesus is a gentleman. He waits at the footstep of your heart and he knocks. And he says to anyone who will let me in, I will come in and I will make you a new creation. I will forgive your sins. But God will never force 
his way into your life. If you do not choose Jesus, Jesus will not bind you to him. He will not make you believe in him. It's a choice. You and I have a free will choice where we get to choose to receive Jesus as our savior or we can reject him. And he doesn't do anything to manipulate that choice. All he does is he continues to show up again and again and again and say, I love you. I die. I sent my son I, to die for you. You don't have to do this on your own. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way to salvation. Who are you crying out to these days? If it's not Jesus, I want to invite you, even if it's for the first time, to cry out to Jesus. He knows you, he loves you, and he has good plans for you. That's what Jonah missed in this. Jonah went down under the boat while the sailors were calling out to anybody who would maybe help them because they didn't know the true God yet. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay and fell into a deep sleep. So Jonah's, Jonah's down there, he's out. Uh, he's just kind of doing his thing, right? <laughs> um, have you ever been in a season where you kind of just go below deck, kind of check out a little bit, where things are too hard? Maybe you numb out. I think numbing out is a big part of our culture, right? And there's a thousand different ways to do it. It doesn't have to be drugs and alcohol, although that's some people's weapon of choice. It can be food. It can be TV. It can be exercise. It can be family. It can be anything. It can be fitness. There's all these things that we can turn to to numb out our own pain and our own disobedience, right? The earth's chalked full of them. And so I know, because I'm human, I know that there's something in each of our lives that we can tend to turn to, to kind of numb out whatever feels uncomfortable or hard or scary. And so I wonder, what is your numbing mechanism? For Jonah, it was just acting like nothing was happening and he went below deck. He tried to sleep off what was happening. He tried to forget it. He didn't want to think about it. He didn't want to be in the chaos, so he tried to drown himself in sleep to kind of forget what he was actually doing. Is there anything in your life that you're using to numb yourself that maybe Jesus is inviting you to simply trust him with? To not numb out, to not make it non-existent, because we all know that you can't, we can't numb over pain. It's still there when the numbness f- fades away. We have to deal with it. And God says, I want you to come with me. Come to me and we'll deal with it together. Don't tune it out. So Jonah, he goes below deck, he falls asleep. And then what happens? Verse six, it says, the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. So verse number six, the captain wakes Jonah up. Friends, We are being invited to wake up. To wake up from slumber, to wake up from numbness, to wake up from disobedience, to wake up from the way that we're living that isn't in line with God. You see, so often we can get kind of coaxed into these lives that just kind of coast along and are kind of comfortable, and we can almost be on autopilot where we're not even aware of what's happening. We're not even aware of all the little ways that you and I are being disobedient. We're not even aware that there's a bigger kingdom at stake, that there are people who need us and need our obedience. Sometimes we get into kind of autopilot mode, and we just, we fall asleep at the wheel. Um, I used to be a youth pastor in Portland, and one of the families in the youth group would often have uh, the kids over at their house to hang out. And the youth group where I worked in Portland, is it drew kind of from a far network, and so there were kids that lived up to like an hour away. And so in the summer, they would hang out there, and they often hung out super late at night. And so one summer, uh, we had two students fall asleep behind the wheel when they were driving home. They went home at, you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Uh, the first student, his name was Alex, and he was driving home uh, late in the night. He was tired. He'd been hanging out all day, and he literally fell asleep, and his car veered, and he ended up crashing into a bank, and that's when he woke up. But when the cops came to examine the incident, his skid marks were not in alignment with what they should have been. He should have gone straight into a, like a column, a cement column, that he would have made him die on impact. And instead, his car literally swerved. You can see the skid marks that were not natural. They were, you know, supernatural. They slid it, and he went a lot further and hit the building with less impact later on, and he survived. The second student was driving late, and his name was Brian, and he went off the, went off the road, went into the ditch and flipped his car twice, woke up and was unharmed. 
Alex and Brian were both unharmed. But that summer, I learned a lot about the value of being alert and being awake. And this is true for our lives too. When you and I fall asleep in life, when we go in autopilot, there are so many opportunities for consequences. So many things that the enemy can use to destroy families, marriages, lives, dreams, hopes. The enemy is like a lion. He prowls around seeking for someone to desire to devour. And you and I, we have the authority in Christ to wake up, to wake up to what's true, to wake up to what the real invitation is to follow Jesus and not to be dissuaded or or coaxed into living for ourselves in the way that we want to live. And this is a perfect example of Jonah falling asleep at at the wheel. He had a mission, he was on assignment, and he checked out and ran the other way. And so I want to invite us today, I want to invite us to pray, and I'm going to give you a few just reflection questions for you to respond to with the Lord, and my hope is that when you get to your groups, uh, you can have some honest discussion about where do you need the Lord to work in your life this week. So will you bow your heads with me and pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the lesson of Jonah, Father, and Father, I just ask right now that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, and just reveal anything uh, that maybe maybe we're too scared to see, maybe we don't really want to acknowledge, Lord. We know that you bring us freedom, and there is no condemnation for those in Christ, and so I just pray a freedom for every woman here to honestly examine her heart, Lord. And so uh, today I just put before you the question, uh, where are you falling asleep behind the wheel? In what area of your life have you kind of drifted into autopilot and you're not really aware, you're not really alert, you're not really giving your full focus or attention to, you're kind of just getting by and hoping that it doesn't hurt anybody? Is there any area of your life where you've become spiritually apathetic, where you've kind of checked out? You might know it's sin, but it's not really hurting anyone. It's not that big a deal. So uh, you kind of just let it simmer in the back burner saying, someday I'll deal with that, but it's not not really a big deal right now. Is there any area of your life where you've been numbing, kind of checking out and saying, God, it's too much for me to deal with, and so I just need a break, and I just, I gotta, I gotta figure this out on my own, so I'm just gonna kind of tone, tone down the emotion, and so I just, I need this. It's kind of a crutch that I feel safe with. Uh, Is there any area that the Lord wants to reveal that he doesn't want you to numb out and instead he wants you to trust him with every ounce of it instead? And is there any area of your life that God's trying to wake you up? Lord, these are hard questions. And often, I think when I'm honest and we're honest, we, we sometimes don't want to hear what the answer is. Uh, so Lord, I just pray a spirit of courage <clears throat> over myself, over each woman that's here, Lord, uh, that we would wrestle with hard questions. God, we can wrestle with hard questions because we know that you are a loving God who loves us unconditionally and will never leave us and forsake us. No matter what the answers to these questions are, they don't change God's love for us. And so, Father, I pray that you'd invite us into just security, into safety of relationship with you, into that unconditional love where we're safe enough to examine the truth, Lord, maybe where we're veering off the path or where we're numbing out. But, Lord, I pray protection over every woman in this room, Father, because I know that the enemy is always seeking to get us off course. And we'll see that in the book of Jonah. Jonah going off course uh, had potentially huge consequences for an entire people group, Father. And so, Lord, we just confess any disobedience in our own lives, and we just say we want to be obedient because we want you to use us to bless the world, Father. And so, Lord, I pray for a spirit of courage and wisdom for women, including myself, uh, to look deeper into maybe areas that we've gone astray in this season, Father. And I pray you say that all who confess their sins will be forgiven. That's a promise, Lord. So when we bring something to the light, 
Lord, you heal it and you forgive us and you wash us white as snow. So Father, would there be repentance and confession and healing, God, and restoration this week in our community. So I pray a blessing over each woman that's here tonight, God, and we just invite you uh, to give us honest conversation in our tables, Father. So we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the love you offer us and the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen.